shadow of Mount Sinai by Peter Sloterdijk, translated by Phelan Hoban. Section 3. The Sinai Schema. Integral Swearing In. In the following, I will look a little more closely at certain elements of the famous Sinai episode from the Exodus account in the Pentateuch, characterizing it as the primal scene of ancient Jewish anti-miscegenation policy. I will calmly operate on the assumption that the Sinai account and the entire construction of the Exodus epic, with its odysseys, rebellions, and miracles, is largely a literary fiction in the mode of a posteriori prophecy, probably written between the 8th and 6th centuries BC and reworked in the post-exodic period. I cannot participate in speculations about the possible inclusion of residues of real events from earlier epochs in these tales. Hence, in the present essay, the question of geographically identifying the Sinai location, there seem to be about 14 different hypotheses concerning this, is of no significance. Furthermore, it is no cause for concern that Moses could hardly have brought two stone tablets inscribed by God's fingers down from the height of the mountain to the camp of his people. The Munster Old Testament specialist, Eric Zenger, wrote the necessary things about this with touching clarity, quote, no unique, empirically concrete event of whatever nature becomes visible behind the Sinai accounts in the book of Exodus. No historical covenant was made at Mount Sinai. There was no handing over of stone tablets by God to Moses on Mount Sinai, nor was there any fashioning of golden calves by Moses' people or other Sinai Bedouins. Close quote. One can conclude that with no golden calf, there was likewise no mass slaughter of dancers around the calf, nor any other religiously motivated acts of terror committed by the supporters of Moses against their own people. And naturally, there were no Levites who could have distinguished themselves in the butchery of the apostates. The true location of all these events is purely in the stories themselves. The stories, for their part, have their vital location in the, quote, Israeliogenic rites, that is to say, the people-stabilizing sacrificial acts and text readings that took place between the 8th and 5th centuries BC in connection with the Jerusalem temple cult. According to recent archaeological research, the legendary temple of Solomon was built only some 200 years after Solomon's death in the mid-8th century BC and acted as the country's cult center until its destruction by the troops of Nebuchadnezzar II around 586 BC. Because no real historical findings can be assigned to the Sinai stories, the observer must rate their symbolic significance for the swearing in of the people to its religious constitution all the more highly. In this context, we finally arrive at the question of how, quote, monotheism and violence are connected. The wording of some passages that will be critically elucidated will show why there is little to be gained by identifying the problem of violence primarily as a religio-theoretical construct called, quote, monotheism, whose evasive meaning I have already pointed out. Instead, the analysis will now foreground the function of the conventional singularization project with its psychosocial and moral costs. In fact, the account of the breach of covenant by the people of Israel during the absence of Moses on the mountain of God, as described in chapter 32 of the book of Exodus, provides the unsurpassable paradigm of an act of violence motivated by the singularization contract. The description of it contains one of the most terrible passages of all time in the whole of religious history. When Moses, returning from the mountain, finds the people dancing around the idol amid shouting, he casts the idol down and has it burned, then ground to powder. What remains somewhat mysterious is the religious leader's instruction to scatter the dust of the destroyed calf on the water and force the Israelites to drink it. This is followed by unprecedented butchery, quote, So he stood at the entrance to the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the Levites rallied to him. Then he said to them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Each man strap a sword to his side. Go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other, each killing his brother and friend and neighbor. And the Levites did as Moses commanded. And that day, about 3,000 of the people died. Close quote. Exodus 32, 26-28, NIV. It has often been noted, and rightly so, that the outbreak of violence described there does not show, end quote, extroverted, offensive, or imperial direction of impact. On the contrary, 
it is a case of, quote, inwards directed violence. One could almost speak of autogenocidal drama. As far as the number of 3,000 dead is concerned, it is not easy to decide whether this is a pragmatic or a symbolic number. At any rate, it describes a tremendous amputation performed on the body of the Mosaic people. Indeed, the information that the Levites gathered around Moses permits the assumption that this must have been an act of extermination, always on the site of the imaginary, carried out by the minority faithful to Moses against the majority that followed Aaron. The quoted passage, in fact, states that the people, one can presumably read this as, quote, the entire people, except for the officious Levites, took part in the festival of idolatry. One cannot help being amazed that it was the Levites of all people, members of a priestly group, who were at the ready to carry out the divine command. The objection that there cannot yet have been any Levites at that time is of no consequence due to the fictional status of the account. It is then all the more significant that, for lack of real historical content, the tale of the extermination of the temporarily apostate members of the people takes on an outstanding symbolic character, perhaps even an exemplary dimension. The Levites' obedience to the Mosaic instruction, however, meant that they could kill without being murderers. They were breaking the fifth commandment formally announced a short while earlier, bracket Exodus 20, but their deadly actions were subject to a higher law, a form of religious emergency law. It seems that the sword-wielding Levites were acting as successors to the sacred executioners of prehistoric times, whose overwritten traces in several Old Testament passages have recently, however hypothetically, been deciphered. The decisive insight into the autoplastic, popular pedagogical significance of the Levitic slaughter is offered by the overall structure of the Exodus scenes on Mount Sinai. Their form, which shapes the sequence of events in these separate episodes, corresponds to the traditional narrative triad, which regularly passes through the sequence of initial state, interference incident, and restoration. The story's center of gravity obviously lies in the sealing of the covenant, brokered by Moses between Yahweh and Israel, whose strength as a means of singularizing their identity amid the competing cults of the polyethnic situation in the Middle East has already been mentioned. In that context, Yahweh still appears with the traits of an invisible tribal chieftain. The relationship between him and his followers is closer to a feudally relevant swearing in of minions to their feudal lord than a spiritually deepened correspondence between God and the people, let alone God and the individual soul. After the failure of Israel's attempts during the royal period inaugurated by David, bracket 1012 to 597 BC, to intervene in the concert of regional empire formations between Mesopotamia with its own state creations, the religious leaders of the people must have decided to take greater recourse to covenant theological thought figures. These had, admittedly, also been kept alive in early prophetic literature through occasional interventions. The pathos of self-isolation inevitably experienced immense growth as a result of the disaster conditioned boom in covenant theology after the catastrophe of 597 BC, as these stories from Exodus show. This is emphatically reflected by the structure of the Sinai account, in which we encounter not only the narrative triad of the sealing of the covenant, back in Exodus 19.24, the breach of covenant, back in Exodus 32, and then the restoration of the covenant, back in Exodus 34, which seems obligatory for a resolution of a good story in keeping with the laws of narration. In addition, the exorbitant violence of the middle part, which depicts the eruption of interference, reveals how willing the narrators of the Sinai drama were to immerse themselves in the problem, which had always been virulent, but now constituted a more gaping abyss than ever of the breach of covenant. The talked-up breach of covenant at Mount Sinai, then, is not simply a cult historical episode that gives pious minds food for thought. It is of a prototypical character. The thought of it, and the constant danger of its repetition, develops into an obsession. More still, it grows into a thought form that virtually promises its users the key to the dark vicissitudes of Israel's history. 
I therefore refer to the obsessively recurring motif of the breach of covenant as the, quote, Sinai schema. It makes the price of Israel's singularization amid the intense cultic and military competition between peoples palpable. In the fictional primal scene at the foot of the mountain of God, the motivic connection between the breach of the covenant and the summary trial was displayed with archetypal power and made available for transference to any remote context. It supplies the prototype of a, quote, connection between deeds and consequences, close quote, to recall the technical term popular among Old Testament experts. With the help of the Sinai schema, the breach of covenant results in punishment by extermination, then the journey continues with the rest. It becomes virtually possible to read the history of Israel both forwards and backwards, especially where, as during Babylonian exile, it was experienced or interpreted as a history of misfortune. While the extermination at Mount Sinai followed the manifest breach of covenant at a brief interval and following a linear logic, later, initially inexplicable ordeals suffered by the people can be attributed only indirectly to what remained a latent breach of covenant. This latter was usually recognized only by the prophets and priests, who traced a path backwards from the manifest punitive suffering to the latent offense. The concept of sin itself, without which the course of the Jewish, Christian, and Islamic history of ideas, feelings, and cults is unimaginable, is colored from the start by the ever-present danger of a breach of covenant. Essentially, every sin is a regression to life before the Sinite conversion. Each individual sin refreshes the primary sin of betraying the covenantal duty, indeed almost of betraying God, with varying explicitness. Readers of the Bible will encounter an early and typical application of the Sinai schema in chapter 25 of the book of Numbers. It recounts how the people of Israel, while encamped at Shittim, bracket, probably in eastern Jordan, close bracket, began to, quote, indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women, close quote, and participated in sacrifices to the Moabite, quote, gods. The consequences were predictable, quote. The Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of these people, kill them and expose them in broad daylight before the Lord, so that the Lord's fierce anger may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to Israel's judges, each of you must put to death those of your men who have joined in worshipping the Baal of Peor. Close quote. Numbers 25, 45. Here too, as at Sinai, the general ban on killing is replaced by a higher duty to kill, an exemption that in these cases does not follow from any warrior ethics, but rather imposes itself as an inevitable consequence of the breach of covenant. Furthermore, the same passage reports that a plague broke out among the Israelites, claiming 24,000 lives. The pestilence, whose punitive character becomes evident in retrospect, ended only with Penihas, a grandson of the priest Aaron, discovered the source of evil when he took his spear and ran through an Israelite who had slept with a Midianite woman. Quote, the Lord said to Moses, Penihas has turned my anger away from the Israelites. Therefore tell him I am making my covenant of peace with him. He and his descendants will have a covenant of a lasting priesthood, because he has zealot, he was zealous for the honor of his God and made atonement for the Israelites. Numbers 25, 10-13 In the light of all this, it goes without saying that the priests of Israel considered the decades of Babylonian exile a punishment for a latent chronic breach of covenant. Incidentally, recent research contradicts the priestly myth of the Jewish people sighing under the yoke of captivity. Many members of Israel's upper class felt quite at ease in their colorful place of exile, which was almost like a Mesopotamian New York. They enjoyed freedoms of all kinds, and it is no coincidence that they remained there even after the fall of Babylon. Only after the Arab-Israeli War of CE 1948 were its modern descendants driven out of the area which would soon be named Iraq. It is impossible to imagine the overall finding of the Sinai schema without the cultically explicated duty to be cruel, which was meant to be demonstrated by the execution of severe commands from God or human leaders. Thus Moses orders the, war Thus Moses orders the warriors to exterminate the Midianites completely when their exact vengeance for the seduction 
Thus Moses orders the warriors to exterminate the Midianites completely when they exact vengeance for the seduction. He is angered by the news that the Israelite army killed only all the men, taking the women and children prisoner. In his zeal, fueled by awareness of the covenant, Moses insists on killing all boys and grown women too, sparing only the virgin girls. Quote, Save for yourselves every girl who has never slept with a man. Numbers 31.18 In the subsequent Israelite conquest, the Jewish armies are given the task of preventatively exterminating the local populations of Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, so that they cannot even tempt the still impressionable, impressionable covenant people to, quote, follow all the detestable things they do in worshipping their gods, close quote. Deuteronomy 20.18 the danger of the breach of covenant accompanies the further history of the mandatorily zealous program, people with very de various degrees of explicitness. <clears throat> the danger of the breach of covenant accompanies the further history of the mandatorily zealous program, people with varying degrees of explicitness. The Deuteronomist's maximum, quote, show them no mercy, Deuteronomy 7 is often invoked when dealing with, quote, unbelievers and tempters. Naturally, the gruesome acts of Judas Maccabeus, son of the priest Matthias, in his extermination programs against fellow Jews, who were willing to assimilate during the struggle for Jewish cult freedom in the second century BC, consistently follow the principles of the zealous culture founded at Mount Sinai. The Book of Maccabees tells proudly of Judas's acts of violence against the members of his own people. In summary, one can say that the admonition to preserve the covenant unconditionally always entails the strictest cultic duty. Whoever fails to celebrate Passover, bracket, unless on a journey and away from the cult community, close bracket, quote, must be cut off from his people because he did not present the Lord's offering at the appointed time. Numbers 9.13 Quote, whoever sacrifices to any god other than the Lord must be destroyed. Exodus 22.20 Quote, anyone who desecrates the Sabbath must be put to death. Exodus 31.14 These expressions of severity towards unbelievers and foreigners did not survive in the text as relics of titanic crudity. One must view them as deliberate warning signs. They dramatize the connection between simple sin and breach of covenant. The danger of apostasy is always already at hand. The frequently pondered and redacted brutalisms of the Holy Scripture which probably reached its final state around 400 BC, can only be understood through their religious grammar. For this, one must become aware of the psychopolitical peculiarity that what they express is by no means a cheerful primary aggressiveness and ingenuous expansiveness or a naive ethnocentrism. They are derivatives of the precarious prerogative of severity towards oneself that, read positively, we call chosenness.